Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, my name is Gillian Askew. I'll do proper introductions in a second. Um, but we're here today for the webinar on finding opportunities in the public sector. Uh, so thank you for joining. I'll just give it a couple of seconds for, for more people to join. It was a, a, a well um, booked session, so we're expecting it to be a little bit popular this morning, which is always great. So whilst people are joining, I'll just do um, uh, some housekeeping. I'll go through the agenda of what we're going to cover today. Um, so as always, we are on Zoom. So we have both the chat functionality and the Q&A functionality enabled today. If you wanted to introduce yourself and say hi, please feel free to do so on the chat functionality. You can set that to um, either everyone or just hosts and panelists, whoever you would like your chat to be seen by. If you have got any questions, you can ask them throughout. Please feel free to pop them in the Q&A. I have set some time aside for uh, questions at the end, but um, feel free to bob questions through uh, whenever you want to. So um, ultimately, uh, we're going to cover, I'll do a proper introduction in a second. Um, also, we're trying something new. So forgive me, but uh, we're all a little bit guinea pigs this morning. So I haven't used Slido for ages, uh, probably actually over 10 years since I last used Slido. I don't know if anyone on the call today is familiar with it. Um, it's an interactive polling uh, technology. So I've just got three questions I want to ask once I've done an introduction um, and uh, hopefully then uh, we'll be able to make Slido work. When we get there, what you'll get on the screen is a QR code that you can um, either uh, scan with a smartphone or a smart tablet if you've got one of those devices to hand, or, or you can um, go straight to a web link and that will take you there. If it doesn't work, uh, we'll abandon it. Uh, or if you don't have a, a digital device that will um, uh, allow you to get onto the Slido, please forgive me. We are just playing around with what works and what doesn't work. So thank you for, for being a little bit of a, um, a test case for it today. And then we'll think about why public sector contracts, uh, why could they be good for uh, small businesses, especially voluntary sector organizations. Think about the contracting process itself. Uh, we'll also have a look at where we can go, depending on where we are uh, in the country, potentially where we can go to find opportunities. Um, and I plan to do a live contracts finder demo uh, if we've got time. Um, and I might just pop that to the end uh, so we can do that last. And I'll show you what contracts finder is and how to do a really quick search on there. There's some information about the public sector as well, especially um, at this point, we are going into a new regulatory environment in public sector procurement. Now, it, the Public Sector Regulations Procurement Act 2023 was due to go live on the 28th of October. It has been pushed back to February next year. So we have got more time actually uh, to prepare ourselves as providers to the public sector. So there's some information around uh, bidding, what to expect, uh, what notices you'll see when the new regulations do come in. And then finally, before we do a contracts finder demonstration, I'll just whiz through the kind of free support that's an offer from Go for Growth. Uh, I know it can often feel like a bit of a lonely place out there being in a, a smaller business. Um, uh, so you're not alone. There's lots of support that you can um, come and get from Go for Growth. So we'll whiz through a little bit of that as well. So we'll just see how we're going. So firstly, if you've been to a, um, one of our Go for Growth webinars before, you might know who I am, uh, but my name is Gillian Askew. Uh, I'm one of three co-founders of Go for Growth. Um, and on the screen is just a little bit about uh, my career and what I uh, my experience looks like. So uh, I'm a procurement professional by trade. Next year will be my 30th anniversary. Um, uh, I spent 18 years in private sector procurement and the rest has been in public sector procurement. And I've worked across the public sector, including in central government. Um, and since 2013, I've been a micro business owner. Um, and so I say that really just to illustrate that I've uh, walked a mile in both pairs of shoes. I have worked in procurement teams, designing and running procurements that um, we want smaller organizations to answer. And I am and have been for a long time a micro business owner, um, also bidding for public sector contracts. So I understand the challenges uh, that both roles actually have to face. 
And Go for Growth is um, a social enterprise. We're a certified social enterprise. We're a micro social enterprise. So we are a business for good. So impact is the most important thing for Go for Growth. And we place that ahead of, uh, of income. Now, clearly, any business owner will be balancing the financials out with impact. But it was really important to us that we put impact ahead of everything else, that social impact that we can have as an organization. And that's why all of the support that we offer to the marketplace is offered free of charge at point of access, and it will always be free of charge. So when we get to the last few slides about what support is there for from Go for Growth, please don't worry that there's a cost barrier to any of that. Right, I think the next slide is the Slido. So let's see if we can make this work. So what you'll see on the screen coming up is a QR code, as I said, that you can scan in, or you can go to slido.com and pop that number in. The hashtag will already come up. Um, and it should be pretty quick, depending on your connectivity and your signal. Um, and then the question that's on the screen right now, what's your experience with public sector bidding, will also be a um, uh, it will automatically upload for you. So you can um, take a couple of seconds uh, to uh, get that up on your screen if you can. Um, and then choose what your experience is with the public sector bidding process. So it could be that you've tried, but you haven't quite got over the line yet. It could be that you've tried and you've had some success or you might never have done it before and you've or you might have had a look. But for whatever reason, you um, have ended up not taking part. And actually, you could be all of those. But on this one, I think um, you can just choose the one. So if you can choose the one that is most relevant to your organization and then when you've chosen it, if you just hit send, uh, that would be great. So I'll just give it another couple of seconds. As we're going, uh, one of the things to tell you is um, when we look at the 15,000 organizations that Go for Growth are currently supporting, just a little under half, 47%, it's the first time that people are considering going into the public sector. So if you haven't done it before, or if you've been unsuccessful, um, you're definitely not alone. Um, including Go for Growth, I don't think anybody is always successful. So um, uh, please don't worry if you've had a go and it hasn't quite got you where you want it to be just yet. So let's have a look. So 41% have said I've never done it before. So that feels quite consistent. 12% uh, have had a look, but ended up not taking part. 29% uh, have said I've tried, but I've been unsuccessful. And 18% have tried and had some success. So thank you for taking part in that. That's brilliant. So the next question that should automatically come up on your uh, device now that you're using. So um, how big is your organization? So just... Um, we have no closed doors in Go for Growth. Anyone from any sector of any size, any demographic, uh, and at any point in your um, journey, you can always come to Go for Growth and we will do everything that we can to help you. Unsurprisingly, we're often helping smaller and micro organizations. But the choices here are sole trader, partnership registered or unregistered, micro, small, medium, or large, and the number of employees is what we're using to differentiate. So when you're ready, if you can pop in what kind of organization you are, that would be great. And again, press send. And uh, this will stay open um, after uh, as we're going through the slides. So you can you can continue to answer it if you if you want to. So if I have a quick look at what people have said. So, um, yeah, that is really how we normally see the numbers divvy up. So uh, micro organizations, 75 uh, percent are not to 10 employees. Uh, and we've got a few sole traders uh, and a couple of medium and actually 6% of people here today are from large organisations. And as I say, we are no closed doors in Go for Growth, so everyone is always welcome. And the final question, and then we'll get into the meat of the webinar today. And you can choose uh, as many of these as apply, actually. Um, are you any of the following? So a voluntary sector organisation, a community interest company, a kick, are you a social enterprise like Go for Growth, a registered charity? a private limited company, a public limited company, or a limited liability partnership, or if you're none of those and you're something else, uh, just hit other. Um, but you can um, tick as many as apply. So in Go for Growth case, we are a limited company and a registered social enterprise. So I would be ticking uh, those two uh, when I was answering this uh, survey. So 
give it a second. If you can pop in as many as you want and hit send, then we'll move on. Brilliant. So nearly 70%, so nearly two thirds, uh, just over two thirds, sorry, um, are limited companies. We've got some registered charities in there, uh, social enterprise, kick, so around about 12% and 18% are other. So that's really interesting. Um, and that's really useful for us to know who's coming along to the webinars um, uh, so that we can make sure that we, we tailor the content to the audience. So thank you ever so much for, for uh, doing that with me this morning. So if we move into the um, uh, the webinar itself, why public sector contracts? If you've joined a Finding Opportunities webinar before, you might have heard me say some of this. Um, uh, back in 2021, I think, so by the end of 2022, the government had set up a mandate to place 33% of all spend with small to medium enterprises. And that was really centered around delivering public goods. So that social impact that um, taxpayers' money can have on the communities in which it serves. And actually we've kind of moved on a little bit now. Uh, the public sector regulations that I talked about, Procurement Act 2023, is really trying to uh, drive up the priority list, the ability for public sector to uh, access the, <clears throat> you know, the plethora of talent that's in the, the marketplace, especially in SMEs, micro businesses, small businesses, voluntary sector organizations. And one of the things that it's encouraging the public sector to do is not just to identify barriers to SMEs, but also to take reasonable, practicable steps to remove those barriers. And you might see some constructs around that. So you might see when you're going through bid processes that um, you're asked about insurances, accreditations, licenses, that kind of thing. What you might also see is a bit of a shift in that you're not asked to have those things at point of bid, but you're asked potentially on a self-cleaning basis to commit to having those things for contract start date or a date thereafter if you're successful. And that's so that smaller businesses don't have cost barriers or any other barrier to having the accreditation, certifications, et cetera, that they need to be able to take part in an opportunity. Um, and the public sector, I mean, if you if you watch the news uh, at any point, what we'll see more often than not is that uh, there is real pressure on public funds, uh, for sure. But it is a stable market and it's worth around 300 billion a year, about 280 billion. And of course, the public sector buys everything. And you don't have to deal directly with the public sector. You can work in the supply chain as well. So you can work for big principal contractors. That's often true in construction, for example, or even in tech and digital, where you're not necessarily supplying the public sector direct, but you're going through another organization to do so. But the public sector is really focusing on helping uh, local supply bases to build resilience for the future. The pandemic has really taught us that Actually, there's a ton of resilience in small businesses, but it can also be um, absolutely catastrophic economically for communities and business communities when something big happens. And so actually, there's a real focus on building resilience. And public uh, sector procurement is all about transparency, fairness, equity of opportunity. And so, again, there is a real drive through something called uh, the most advantageous tender to be accessible to all organisations, to, to make sure that it's not a fastest race to the bottom on price, but to make sure that every organization has the ability to A, take part and B, add value to uh, those communities that the public sector serves. And there is a real drive to develop local economies. So um, uh, there is a, a real aspiration and a real genuine ambition for public sector contracting authorities to develop and buy into and access those local economies um, that, uh, that would uh, serve the communities in which they reside. And so the process uh, that you would likely engage with has a number of stages in it. So, and we'll talk about notices in a second, which will really help you finding opportunities. But right at the front end of the process is something called pre-market engagement. So you might see a, something called a PIN, which is a prior information notice, or an RFI, which stands for request for information. Um, that kind of thing. So the procurement isn't live yet. And, and effectively, what the public sector are doing is engaging with the market to say, here's what we think we want to buy. Here's how we think we would want to buy it. 
how does that land? Or here is a signal to say something is coming. That's what a prior information notice would do. It would tell you that something is upcoming. Pre-market engagement requests for information are a bit more interactive in that there's usually some push and pull information where the contracting authority is including the organisation in the, the creation of that procurement. Ultimately, at some point, the uh, opportunity will be advertised. And when we get to the contracts finder um, uh, demonstration, I'll show you what that search engine looks like so you can have a figure out how to find them. When it's advertised, when you go into the opportunity through whichever portal it might be, uh, and there are a few of them that will come to, you would look for your invitation for tender to tender, sorry, an ITT, invitation to tender. And that usually has all of the um, information that you need to take you through that opportunity, including key dates such as when you can ask questions till, when you'll get responses to those questions, and crucially, when the submission date is. Included either in the invitation to tender or as a separate document, you'll have something called a, a selection questionnaire uh, that would sit at the front end of, of almost any public sector procurement, and especially if it's above threshold. And the threshold as it stands at the moment, including VAT, is 214,904. It's either 904 or 903, I think, but um, I think we're fine to within a pound. And that's including VAT. So if the total contract value is, is above that, you'll see that the standard selection questionnaire is in use. You'll also have something called a specification, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, some authorities call it a, a statement of requirements, but effectively that's a document and it could be in the ITT or somewhere else. Um, that is a document that tells you effectively what that contracting authority wants to buy and what's important to them, including socially and environmentally uh, through that buying process. So what the goods and services are that they're buying and, and what they are buying against. And fundamentally, you'll have an evaluation criteria. So how will they score your responses? And they normally have five or six levels, uh, not to five or not to 100, whatever it is. And you'll have a definition by that evaluation criteria. So if I score a naught, what would I have not have done to be able to score a naught? And if I score the top score, which is a five, a 10 or 100 or whatever it is, what will have I included in my answer? So it will talk about... Um, uh, it's answered all the question, lots of detail, lots of evidence, etc. And sometimes those questions are weighted. So it will tell you how important that question is to the contracting authority. And that will help you navigate how much effort and time you need to place per question. You'll have quality, technical and pricing questions in any um, uh, tender. So you will, uh, and actually pricing sometimes isn't tested at contract level, uh, depending on, on what kind of contract has gone out there, but you will ultimately have quality and technical questions. And if you want any help answering those, uh, there are some uh, resources that you can get into through Go for Growth, and I'll go through those in a sec. Obviously, you're entering a contractual environment, so there will be legal terms and conditions. And at the end of any process, especially if we're over that threshold, will be a feedback process. In the, under the new regulations, it's something called an assessment summary, but effectively what you'll get is your score, the winning bidder score if you weren't the winning bidder, um, and some feedback on how you went against the uh, evaluation criteria. You can see that four, five, seven, and eight are blue and underlined. There's live links in the slide deck that will come out to you um, to video tutorial, lunch and learns that we did on those four things. So including how to answer quality and technical questions. So you can have a click through those and see if they're helpful. So one of the things I wanted to show you with the, the uh, notice uh, regime. So this will come into force when the Procurement Act itself comes into force. And effectively what we've got on the left is the kinds of notices that people have to put out now. So there's five of them. And under Procurement Act, I think there are 13 or 15 notices. Um, and you can see the section of the Procurement Act on the far right hand side. For us as organisations trying to find opportunities, um, this will be really helpful. Um, secondly, it will all be in one place. And I'll talk to you about the central digital platform in a second. But ultimately, we'll have a pipeline notice, which effectively will show us what's coming from organizations um, we'll have a planned procurement notice again that will show us what's coming a preliminary preliminary if I can say it market engagement notice and a tender notice 
So there are a number of notices now at the front end of that process heading up to actually this is live. So you will have a notice and actually even if that's below threshold um, in section 87 you can see at the bottom of the procurement act notices there is a below threshold notice. So there's actually even more transparency even when the public sector is not over the regulations, even when they're under the regulations. And for us, when we're trying to find opportunities, those notices will be super helpful because they'll be out there in the public domain. Um, so where will we look? Uh, so I'm going to do a, a demonstration on contract signed at the back end of this webinar. Um, that usually has opportunities um, above 25,000, so 30,000, including VAT. If you're in central government, that would be above 12,000, so 10,000 plus VAT, 12,000, including VAT. And it's uh, it's a very personal thing, but it's it, uh, definitely my search engine of choice because it has high value tenders and low value tenders typically in it. The find a tender service. And the central digital platform that I'll talk about in a second will be an extension of the Find a Tender service. So we will be using Find a Tender service going forward, but that is for above threshold um, opportunities. So in um, central government, if that's above 118,000, it will be on Find a Tender. In wider public sector, including VAT, if it's over that 214,000 threshold that I talked about, you will find it on Find a Tender service. And that's for open opportunities, so opportunities that are open to the market. That includes frameworks and dynamic markets, dynamic purchasing systems as well. It includes approved supplier lists, uh, approved provider lists, preferred supplier lists. It includes all of those different types of, of contract. If you're in Scotland, um, you can go to publiccontractscotland.gov.uk. That's where you can have a look at specifically Scottish opportunities. In Wales, you can go to selltowales.gov.wales. And in the Northern Ireland public sector, you can go to etendersni.gov.uk. And then central government, if you want to have a look at um, specifically central government opportunities, you can have a look at um, the Bravo solution. All of those links are live. So when the slide deck comes out to you, you can have a look through um, those uh, links and see where you find it. But the central digital, pl digital platform is going to be super helpful once we are live in the Procurement Act, which uh, currently is February next year. And what it means is that all notices that we've talked about, all pipelines, all opportunities, they will all be in one place. The central digital platform will be where we go as potential bidders and as businesses looking to see what opportunities are either out there now or coming up in the future. The central digital platform will be the place that we go. Um, you will need to register for it. Um, if you don't register for it, you actually won't be able, and I think this is accurate, you won't be able to bid. Um, because what happens is the portals that the public sector use, so uh, if you're bidding for, um, uh, let's say, uh, a, a local authority in Yorkshire in the Humber, you would probably be going through your tender, or if that was a public sector buying organisation in Yorkshire, you might go through Pro Contract Due North. Um, if you are in uh, the Northwest, you might be going through the Chest, for example. They're called e-sender systems. And what they will do is they will communicate with the central digital platform. So effectively, as suppliers, we expect to be in the central digital platform. We can upload some of our key information and that will flow through to the procurement portals that the um, public sector are using. There remains to be seen how the practical functionality will work, but is it is without doubt hopefully a real positive for us as smaller organizations to have everything in one place. So it will include things like uh, public facing KPI reporting that will come into force, the supplier register will be there. And so it will be much more open and transparent going forward. And with that one central repository to go to, it should make searching much easier for us as suppliers. I'm gonna come back to that shortly. Um, from an information perspective, uh, what's important when you're looking for opportunities? What could you ask yourself, for example? And, and this information came from the former head of procurement at Bradford City Council um, a couple of years ago, uh, actually three years ago now, when we did the very first finding uh, opportunities webinar. 
we asked uh, the then head of procurement at the City of Bradford Council, what, what do you think bidders need to be thinking about when they're looking for an opportunity in the first place? So these are the questions that he came up with. So does the public sector buy what you're selling? Well, at the outset, I said the public sector buys pretty much everything. Um, but one of the things that we need to understand is how might they buy it? So, uh, for example, we worked when Go for Growth is really new with a, a small business called uh, Ocean Saver. And they, their mission was to remove plastics from the world's oceans. And they sold uh, cleaning uh, materials. You might see them on the shelves at Sainsbury's now. Um, but they were dealing with the public sector through another contractor. So they were in the supply chain. And one of the things they said is, actually, we probably classed somewhere in facilities management, because although the public sector definitely buys cleaning materials, it's part of a much bigger family tree. And so the answer will be, yes, the public sector is buying what you're selling, but how that manifests itself is one of the things I think that's important for us as potential bidders to try and work out. Are we part of a bigger category? Do they buy it directly or do they buy it as part of a cluster that might go through a principal contractor? And if you're unsure of the answer to those questions, my contact details are at the end of this webinar, so you can always have a chat with me. Um, having been in procurement for a while, I might know the answer automatically, or I, I'll definitely be able to go and find out. So um, if you're not sure on what the answer to that is, you can always give me a shout. Do you know who the decision maker is within the contracting authority? And again, that might feel like a silly question or an obvious question, but often there are different decision makers in an authority. Often your contact might not be in procurement. It might be a service delivery lead. So if you're delivering social care services, the person you deal with might be a social worker or part of uh, the commissioning team, for example, as opposed to procurement. And so it is really important to know who the absolute decision maker is within the contracting authority and, and how to try and build a relationship with that person. In public procurement, um, once the competition is live, the entire authority, unless you're the incumbent provider and you need to have day-to-day -day operational conversations, because of transparency and fairness, almost the conversation with the, the contracting authority sort of locks down a little bit. So knowing who your decision maker is and being respectful of that during different uh, processes can be super important. And then do you know where the contracting authority is in its contracting cycle? So um, uh, often... Uh, cold calling um, can be really frustrating for a, a contracting authority because if you've just let a contract for recruitment, for example, and a recruiter is, is trying to get in touch to say, can we work together? And you're actually right at the beginning of a full contract for four years. The answer, sadly, is probably no, we can't have a conversation yet because I've just done a procurement and I, I'm not open to that conversation right now. And so if you, uh, we as businesses, if we can understand and that pipeline um, is really helpful to that, um, and we know that that's going to be on the central digital platform, if we can try and work out where the contracting authority is in its contracting cycle, then we can work out the best time to build those relationships, have those conversations, and the best time for us to prepare to take part in a, a procurement opportunity um, and get ourselves ready for it, basically. And in terms of approaching the public sector, um, I, I did a Meet the Buyer event uh, in London uh, probably two years ago now. And effectively, uh, one member of the audience who is a, a micro business in, in um, uh, not social care per se, but in, in, in a wellness business, had sent 200 emails to a person in a particular local authority and had just had no reply. And I felt so bad for that person because it's soul destroying when you get, um, uh, you know, just get uh, silence back. So we asked uh, Ian about it and he said, actually, um, if you can think about the hook, actually. So um, every contracting authority will be talking about what's important to them on social media. They'll have a policy strategy. All of those things are in the public domain. If you can think about what they're trying to achieve, and you can really tailor your um, conversation to what could be mutually beneficial, 
for them and for your business, then that would constitute a really intelligent approach. And it isn't fail safe. This isn't a silver bullet, by the way. But actually, there's a general consensus that the, the more the approach makes sense and is less uh, cold corny, if that makes sense, the more likely to get a response and a reply it is. However, having said that, if we don't know who the decision maker is and we're going to the wrong person, then we might get radio silence back. It's not great. Respect for me would say, please just tell me I'm in the wrong place. But sadly, we don't always get that. And we know that contracting authorities in all departments are under-resourced and super busy. So if we can do the legwork and try and make sure that we know who the decision maker is, we know where they're at in the contracting cycle and we know what they need and what we have to offer and how those two things go together, then we might have a better chance at getting um, responses back and then building that all important relationship with the contracting authority. Some information for everybody that uh, might just be useful while we're um, thinking about just the things I've talked about. So. What's really important in the public sector, you'll see it in bids and opportunities, under threshold and over threshold, that social impact that every single procurement can make. The Public Services Act of 2012, which was assented to law in 2013, so it's not new legislation, it's 11 years old now, more than that, nearly 12 years old. Um, it's all about creating new businesses, new jobs, new skills, making sure that every pound of public money is working as hard as it possibly can socially as well as economically. And that includes things like tackling climate change, reducing waste, and, but also, and crucially, improving supplier diversity, really driving innovation, and that resilience word that I talked about on the top of the webinar today. You will see net zero carbon becoming more and more important. Um, currently, if the opportunity is over 5 million, you will require a net zero strategy, a carbon reduction plan. But we are seeing more of those things being asked for at lower value uh, opportunities. And a go for growth are just going through a bid process. And we are including our net zero carbon uh, reduction action plan uh, as standard as part of our bid submission. Um, but the markets themselves, uh, so that planned procurement notice uh, that I talked about, uh, pipelines, for example, um, they should be published 18 months in advance. Currently, in the Act itself, it says that's only above 2 million in contract value, which, of course, is not where smaller businesses are typically looking in terms of opportunities. So we are really asking the public sector to flow that down to smaller contract opportunities, certainly below threshold as well, but you know, as low as they can go, so that smaller businesses looking for smaller opportunities have the same opportunity to prepare um, and see what's coming. And in terms of uh, going forward, a market assessment should be done to determine the market health. So the procurement should come after we know that it will, uh, that the market is ready, mature enough and able to respond to it. And that should be done through market assessments. So you should see those notifications at the front end. And there's a real drive still to improve that supply diversity, really engage innovation and make sure that we've got resilience in our local markets. So last couple of slides, and then I'll uh, do a quick demo of uh, Contracts Finder. Um, I've said it can feel like a lonely place. It certainly does uh, to uh, all the small businesses that I've worked in, but you're not alone. Go for Growth is here to help. Uh, all of our contact details are on there. We've got a bookable calendar, so you can go straight into my calendar if you want to. Um, and you can find out more information on our social media as well. Um, also on our website, you can see on the screen, if you go on our website, we've got something called membership resources um, and I've circled it, it's in the top right in yellow. Um, in there, there's 216, I think it is at the minute, free resources. It includes events, uh, training courses, lots of guides, templates, downloadable documents. They're all free there for you to, to utilize. So if you want to have a play around in there, there's a filtering uh, functionality on it in a minute, but we are working with our web designer to build a real language search. So by the end of October, we should have a, a, an even better search functionality in there, but lots of help in there. And then actually we've got something called the Public Sector Supply Ready Accreditation, the PSSR, and it's at the bottom left of the screen. Um, lots of businesses, if I've said to them, um, are you ready to do business with the public sector? They've said, I actually don't know because I don't know what ready looks like. What does that mean? And so we've developed the public sector supply ready, excuse me, accreditation 
to help uh, businesses to work through what the key tools are that you need in your toolkit, including that standard selection questionnaire in order to take part in opportunities, in, in order to get ready. If you're already ready, if you already think you're mature and you're there, um, you can use the PSSR as a bit of a checklist, if you like, but also once you're certified, you do get the logo and a certificate and it comes with 12 hours of continued professional development as well. So that will give you an indication of how much time it will take to do it. You don't have to do it in one go, but it can be a really useful tool regardless of where you are on your journey to prepare for public sector opportunities. So feel free to have a look at that as well. And there are some courses, these are live links as well. We've got a social value course, a bid skills course and a procurement act course. So um, you can, they're um, really light touch, but there's some really useful information in there. Um, if you um, want to go to any of those courses, again, they're all free of charge. Um, you can have a look at them. Um, and ultimately when you get through the end, there is a short assessment um, and then you can request a certificate of completion if you want it and you can use that as part of your own continued professional development so we've got some courses there for you to have a look at and if you want to stay in touch with us you absolutely can uh, we don't spam so we send a roundup email out once a month which is hopefully full of um, both interesting but also relevant stuff around public sector procurement so we're obviously talking about the procurement act quite a bit um, if you, when you register for the members resources, you can opt to sign up. If you don't sign up, um, other than on the back of events like this, when we send the slide decks out, we won't, uh, we won't email you. Um, we are really keen, A, to be GDPR compliant, but also to let you drive the relationship with Go for Growth so that you're in control of it. So you can chat to us when you want to, uh, but if you don't want to hear from us, you don't have to either. So I can see there's a couple of things in the chat. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second whilst I get the demo ready. Um, of course, uh, if you've got to um, uh, leave, don't worry about it. Um, the, the slide deck and a copy of the recording will come out um, and you can do any of those courses. We have a bid skills workshop actually, which is a virtual workshop for half a day coming up on the 7th of October. It's 9.30 to get past the school run if anyone's doing school run until 12 o'clock, but it's packed full of interactive exercises on bid skills. So if anybody wants to come along to those, they absolutely can. So let me just get Contracts Finder up and I'll do a super quick demo whilst I'm getting that ready. If anybody uh, wants to um, pop any questions in the Q&A, please do feel free. Hopefully you can see Contracts Finder um, in the screen. So it's contractsfinder.service.gov.uk and it will take you to this search. So effectively it's a real language search so you can put whatever words that are relevant to your business in there so if i put procurement consultancy consultancy in there to start with um, and then you can uh, choose to look for a region so you might choose west midlands for example or you could even go down for a postcode and pop a geographical radius into it I'll leave it at all locations for now. It will automatically have ticked early engagement, future opportunity and opportunity. You can also ask it to show you awarded contracts if you're trying to figure out where somebody is at in the contract cycle. But I'll leave it as it is for now and I'll just click search. So it will take a second because whenever I'm on screen, it goes uh, as, as slow as it can for me. So 611 notices have come up. Well, I, I can't look through 611 and 468 of them are a live opportunity. Now, the thing to note, and it will tell you it in here in advanced search, um, because I've put procurement consultancy in that way, it will bring up anything to do with procurement or consultancy. So it could have either of those words in uh, so consultancy services framework, procurement powered innovation, consultancy and commissioning. So I'm going to drill down a little bit so I can do an advanced search. So the first thing I might do is put a plus sign between those two words and that will ask it to bring up both words in a notice, procurement and consultancy. So let me update the results. 
and see what that does. So that's reduced it to 24 notices straight away. So I've now got, I think, probably a more reasonable search. So I can start to refine it. Um, so you can see down here, it's got notice suitability, small to medium enterprises, VCSEs, voluntary community and social enterprise. My personal thing is I actually don't take too much notice of those. You can if you want to. So an opportunity if you want to know whether it is relevant in the contracting authorities eyes for both you can tick them i leave them unticked uh, my view is i will work out whether my business can deliver that um regardless of whether i'm a SME or a vcse it is it is my job to determine whether we're capable and have capacity to do it um, you can look at the sector you can look at the location again you can put a value range in and you can update a cpv code so if you want to, and it stands for a common procurement vocabulary, if you want to uh, put an actual code in, you can start typing it. So there is a code for procurement consultancy services. So if we select that and add it, we can update the results and see what that does to the 24. And now there are four notices. So you can play around with this search. You can, if I um, take out that CPV code for a second, and actually if I um, remove that plus sign and enclose it in speech marks, uh, that will look for it as concurrent words, as a sentence effectively. And if I now update results, we'll see what that does to the search. So it's now looking for procurement consultancy actually as a as a word in and of itself and there are no notices so what i really want to do is go back to where i was i want to take away those speech marks and update my results and get back to those 24 notices and that's where we'll end up so 24 notices once we find one we can have a, a click through and it will tell us some information about it so it's a hundred thousand pounds published on the 21st of August, it's closing tomorrow. So it might be a bit late for me to have a look at that one. They're saying it is suitable for SMEs, but potentially not for VCSEs. And it'll tell you where you need to go. So this is on Atomist, which is a procurement portal, and it will send you there. So if you click through, it will take you to the particular portal that you need to be in. And that's where all your documents will be. Uh, and where at this point, until the Procurement Act goes live, where you would be bidding that opportunity. So it's a whistle stop tour on contracts finder. You can play around with it to your heart's content. I don't think you can break it. Um, so, and if you are struggling with any of the search engines or the portals, please do give me a shout um, and we'll do all we can to help. Um, let me have a look at the questions. Some of the tenders look like they've been written by someone that's not in the same area. They can often be extremely vague. How should we approach it? Should we provide a quote, but provide conditions this week? So. Um, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, one of the things on our tender ready training that I typically talk about is caveating. Now, if you've got something that's particularly vague in a specification or a question, um, the clarification process is there for you to ask questions, for you to really drill down on the things that you think you need to know in order to be able to answer that procurement. If at all possible, we would always advise avoid caveating. So because it's hard to score, because you might caveat one way and someone else caveat another way. And then it's really difficult to compare apples with apples. So if you have any um, uncertainty or you think it's too vague and therefore you're not quite sure how to go about pricing it, for me, you would ask a question through the clarification process and only if it's completely unavoidable or it's set up that way for scenario based pricing, for example, you would avoid caveating if you can. Um, you might not be able to, um, but if you can uh, use the clarification process, that's why it's really important when you get your documents, have a look at the key dates straight away because the clarification process will close before your submission goes in and often a good couple of weeks before your submission goes in. And once that closes, although a contracting authority could answer it if they want to, they're not bound to uh, and often are, are too busy to. So if you have a question, get it in as early as you possibly can. Um, is there a good way of finding very small or irregular contracts? Um, yeah, so it, it actually is really difficult. Once we're under threshold, um, it becomes more complicated. 
what you have at the minute is something called a contracts register. So, um, and there are things called a contracts procedure rule. So every public sector organization should be publishing what their process is under threshold. So uh, up to 5,000, it's quotes only, and you're invited to quote, or um, 5,000 to 25,000, it will be written quotes only, uh, and it must go to, uh, or one quote must come from a local provider. 50,000 to threshold, it might still be a competition actually, and therefore it will be on contracts finder. In wider public sector, more often than not, anything above 25,000 should be on contracts finder if it's open to the market. But we are in a, a bit of a situation at the minute where if we want to know about a specific, specific public sector organisation and what they're doing, we would need to go to their website. The central digital platform will help us with some of that, but not all of it when we get down to the, the lower end. Um, so if you know who you think you want your client to be, have a look at uh, their website and it should tell you how they advertise and what they do at what level. And then thinking about who that decision maker in could be useful. If it's not being advertised, it's about building a relationship with the right person. Um, we are at time. So we've actually gone a minute uh, over. So uh, we have got uh, one other um, question, which I've actually just answered. So that's good. We've gone through the questions. Um, thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining. I will get the slide deck and the recording out within the next 24, 48 hours maximum. My contact details will be on there. Give me a shout if you need anything. And I hope everybody has a good rest of their Tuesday. Thank you ever so much for coming along.